Okay, so my name is Wesley Anderson. Um, I am a PhD student at the University of Florida, uh, getting my PhD in wildlife ecology and conservation. Uh, my co-author on this is Dr. Raul Bouton. He was my advisor for the duration of my PhD. And all my research took place at Buck Island Ranch. Um, so what I'm gonna share with you today is just a general overview, a quick overview of my dissertation research, all of it. Um, because I, I figure, you know, if you got questions, you can certainly reach out and ask for more detail, but I'm just gonna hit the highlights here. Okay, so an introduction. Where does uh, wildlife ecology and conservation and management occur? Uh, some people, they think about charismatic megafauna, such as these elephants in Africa. Others think more about protected areas. Uh, this is a picture taken in the Everglades. Uh, finally, others, when they think more about management, they're thinking about game species. Uh, regardless, we need to recognize that 38% of the world's land is under agriculture. 26% uh, of the world's land is specifically under, uh, is considered rangeland. And in Florida, rangeland actually accounts for a pretty large area. So um, about a third of the land area of Florida is considered rangeland. Uh, if you live in Florida, you know that it is urbanizing rapidly and has been. Uh, by 2060, the population may double. With that, we're going to lose uh, 121,000 hectares of agricultural land and 109,000 hectares of natural habitat that will be converted into more uh, urbanized areas. With all that said, you know, with how much land uh, rangeland accounts for in the state and how quickly the state is urbanizing, wildlife conservation and management in these lands is critical. So I'm going to talk about rangeland. All right, so uh, this talk focuses a lot on wild pigs. Wild pigs are an invasive species. They've been in Florida since the 1500s. They're uh, introduced during the DeSoto expedition, uh, certainly not at the densities we see them now, but now in South Central Florida, they are some, at some of the highest densities in the country. Uh, they cause a lot of environmental, uh, human health, uh, and economic impacts. However, one of the most uh, impactful things that they do is rooting. So this is where they dig down into the soil, and I'm gonna get this video playing. This is stitched together from some of our game cam in imagery. I know it's a little dark. Um, these were taken at night. Pigs are often active at night. Um, but you can see how quickly they can root up an area. So although a lot of the impacts of wild pigs have been uh, the focus of a lot of study, uh, other areas haven't received as much attention, uh, particularly the impacts to aquatic fauna. So that's really the direction that I took my dissertation. So my study site, um, I know I, I've met a lot of people at Archibald over the years. I've worked at Buck Island since 2015. I lived full time, you know, rented a house on site from uh, May 2016 through November 2018. So I spent a lot of time out in those wetlands. Um, just want to show you a site overview. This is Buck Island Ranch. Um, and then just a few features. So. It is divided up amongst uh, pastures. So those are all fence lines you can see there in orange. Uh, across the landscape, there are over 600 seasonal wetlands. That was, was, was really what I was focusing in on. You can see those in green. A little bit more difficult to see, but there, blue is the ditch network. Um, so there are hundreds of kilometers of ditches there. Finally, for the purposes of my study, I focused down on uh, 36 wetlands. Um, they're roughly the same size. They're equally distributed between improved pastures and semi-native pastures. Okay, so getting into first, uh, first research chapter, looking at wild pig diet. Uh, so past studies have used DNA metabarcoding to examine seasonal shifts in diet of other species. Um, the technique has also been used for pigs. However, it hasn't been used to examine seasonal shifts in the diet of wild pigs. So what we wanted to do here was inventory the diet items, compare diet shifts across the entire year, and then evaluate the impacts on wetland species with an emphasis on amphibians. And this was in collaboration uh, with a number of different labs. I need to mention that. So for a full year, we collected pig poop. The ranch was divided into five areas. We would collect at least five samples every two months from each area, so 25 samples every two months. We ended up with over 200 samples. We did have to discard some of those. You know, sometimes pig poop's hard to identify, so we didn't always pick up pig poop in the case of 17 
samples. Um, some was just too old, the DNA was too degraded. We had almost 200 samples that we retained. And from there, using uh, next generation sequencing uh, and DNA metabarcoding techniques, we used three previously published primer sets, uh, one for plants, one for animals and fungi, and one specific to vertebrates. So essentially, whenever they're, when analyzing those samples, whenever there was a match uh, for one of those primer sets, it was then compared to the sequences in the BLAST database. And that's all good, but the list that was generated, we actually had to go through and do some QAQC where we compared you know, the consensus lineage. So here at the bottom, you can see Quercus, which is oak. Um, we just had to compare that, make sure that what we're seeing were taxa that could actually occur at Buck Island Ranch. Um, so just focusing on a few results that I'm very interested in, uh, wetland animal taxa consumption across time. So it was low from March through uh, October. From November to February, it really started to peak. There were five amphibian taxa consumed, that includes eastern narrow mouth toads. Um, and of particular interest to me are the sirens and dwarf sirens. This is only in January and February. And these taxa, they estivate in the soil during the dry season. So there's a lot of good evidence here suggesting that pigs are actually digging them up from the wetlands and consuming them while they're estivating. Okay, moving on to drones and pig rooting. Uh, here, I wanna develop a rooting analysis protocol. So using a drone, uh, taking those pictures, mosaicing the images together, and then performing spatial analyses on the mosaic images to quantify how much rooting was occurring. So this was occurring both at um, the 36 wetlands on site that I, I'm focused on, as well as 24 pastures. And this is just looking what, the, uh, what it looks like once all the pictures are stitched together. You can see some rooting here in the uh, upper left corner along the edge of the wetland. That's pretty easily identified. But um, how, how we got here. So I used ArcGIS, uh, ArcGIS use a maximum likelihood classification, so essentially telling uh, ArcGIS which areas were not rooted, which areas are rooted. It would then run a maximum likelihood classification analysis. From there, this is what it would look like after we had clipped it to the, uh, the boundary. And after we, there were a lot of steps I'm leaving out here, but essentially when we got to this stage, uh, I would need to go through and delete incorrectly classified polygons. So looking at this area that's circled, this is correctly classified. We can see that that's obviously rooting. This is incorrectly classified. Um, for whatever reason, the tops of the vegetation came out uh, very similar in color to, uh, to uh, the rooting. So from there, we can calculate the extent of rooting damage. And I did use those data then to uh, use as variables in my uh, studies that I'm going to discuss. Uh, just so for each wetland, I knew the cumulative amount of rooting damage uh, for the preceding dry season. Okay, so uh, moving on, uh, impacts of invasive fauna on aquatic communities. I really wanted to, uh, to uh, examine the impacts on aquatic salamanders, so those sirens and also amphi amphiumas. Uh, for three summers, I trapped them using crayfish traps. I placed 15 traps randomly in each wetland and checked them once a day for five days. I really, I didn't recapture a single salamander. I was warned about that. Um, Luckily, I recorded all the taxa, not just salamanders that I captured. So this resulted in a large data set on uh, a bunch of different aquatic taxa. Uh, I also noticed that this, uh, this site is heavily invaded. There are five exotic taxa, including uh, African jewelfish, brown hoplos, blue tilapia, walking catfish, black acara, sailfin catfish, and island apple snails. Uh, in total, there were 37 taxa trapped. So over um, 15,000 individuals, over uh, 7,000 trap nights. So essentially I checked traps, I checked traps 7,311 times. So there was a lot of trap checking there. Um, just a, a few taxa that I came across by far, the most common were crayfish, uh, striped mud turtles, Easter mud turtles, uh, mud snake. Uh, so just a, a an overview of some of the analyses I conducted. So I, I use multivariate uh, techniques to examine community composition to see uh, what environmental factors and also how uh, both uh, the 
amount of pig rooting and the abundances of the exotic species or invasive species were influencing these communities. Uh, so looking at this, you can see there's pretty good segregation between the community composition between uh, wetlands and semi-native pastures versus improved pastures. Uh, a few other things to point out, uh, there was a lot of difference across time. I get into that more. Um, finally, apple snails. While apple snails are documented uh, amphibian egg predators, uh, and they also can certainly change the vegetation structure, uh, I think that this is much more just because apple snails are very ind uh, indicative of the improved pasture wetlands and they just better uh, estimate things like ram's horn snail and water scavenger beetle abundance than uh, the pasture type alone. So a few things to look here. Um, I used uh, a package in the program R and via Bund to look at both, uh, to look at invasive impacts on both the community level and individual taxa. Uh, so let's pay attention to the, this column right here, the R value. Uh, if it's positive, then there was a positive association between the invasive and the native. If it's negative, there was a negative association. You'll notice that there's, it's pretty equally split between positive and negative associations. Uh, so let's talk about a few. So pig rooting, the only time pig rooting came up was in relation to Florida mud turtles. So the more pig rooting, the fewer Florida mud turtles I've seen. Um, the uh, water snakes, they actually had positive correlations with a lot of the uh, invasive fish species. So I'll talk about that just a little bit more. So impacts on uh, native fishes, there was a negative correlation between jewelfish and top minnows. Uh, impacts on native herpetofauna. So are these water snakes benefiting from exotic fish invasions? Um, I can't say that for sure. I just know that there are more uh, water snakes in those wetlands that have more invasive fishes. Um, but does that have individual or population level consequences? And then finally, pig impacts on small aquatic turtles or semi-aquatic turtles. Uh, what I didn't mention during the diet study is that we found evidence that pigs were consuming Florida mud turtles. So it's pretty interesting to see that, you know, we found that evidence in the diet study in one uh, research project. And then we also saw that there was a negative relationship between pig rooting and uh, mud turtle abundance. Uh, these are very dynamic uh, environments though. Uh, overall, the community structure was strongly driven by habitat, uh, habitat type and year. Um, no two years were the same with hydro pattern. Anybody that's worked in wetlands know you are really at the mercy of uh, precipitation that year as to when they're going to fill up. All right, so then finally, uh, indirect impacts of wild pig uh, pigs on tadpoles. Are pigs indirectly affecting species abundances? So through their rooting behavior, so you can see rooting damage here during the dry season, is that uh, then impacting tadpoles during the wet season with all the changes to habitat? Um, so I noted the same 36 wetlands. For non-rooted wetlands, there are 25 dips. Rooted wetlands, there are 50 dips. So let's focus on 2018. Uh, that uh, hydrologically was the most quote unquote normal of the three years. Uh, caught over 1,700 tadpoles in unrooted areas. Uh, 14 of the wetlands were rooted. Excuse me. <clears throat> um, so some of the most common species, squirrel tree frogs, uh, southern cricket frogs, eastern narrowmouth toads, and green tree frogs. Uh, some species were restricted to one habitat type. Um, so those included things like barking tree frogs and pine woods tree frogs, which were only ever captured in semi-native pastures. So this is a comparison between the uh, captures of tadpoles between non-rooted areas and rooted areas. Uh, if you look here on the right, you'll see the percent change between non-rooted to rooted. In all cases, for all taxa, there was either a, a negative percent change or there was no change, and those were just for taxa that uh, there weren't many individuals captured of, but overall there was a, a negative 65% change between non-rooted to rooted. All right, also I just looking very quickly at... Um, so Wes, I, I, I'm going to have to interrupt you, and if you can get one final thought, we're kind of out of time and we'd like to stay on track. Sorry. Okay, sure. No. Um, so stem, uh, stem density is very important here um, with, uh, with tadpoles and... With that, so, um, you know, tadpoles, they're, uh, or excuse me, pigs, they're eating amphibians, they're consuming salamanders in the winter. 
developed a good method to uh, quantify drone rooting uh, with uh, invasive species community structure as impacted strongly by habitat and year. And uh, finally, uh, with tadpoles, there's a decline from non-rooted to rooted areas and stem density is important for most abundant species. All right, and with that, thank you.